Hey, and a very warm welcome to the Into the Light Web podcast with me, your hostess, Joanna Hunter, metaphysical teacher, spiritual life and business coach, published author, and the high priestess of the Light Web, a spiritual technology that will change your life. This is the place to be to talk everything under the Light Web from consciousness, relationships, to money, to spiritual business, and everything in between. I am super excited to do this roundup episode. So, oh my God, I love these because these episodes are so special because our guests are next level. They're so incredible and I get to introduce them all over again and just pull one of the golden nuggets that they shared with us on their entire episode. So if there is any episodes in this very special episode where I share all my guests, that you really like. All you need to do is just go to the podcast and you can find the whole episode for that person, which is normally anything between a 30 minute to an hour long episode for you to enjoy. So let's get to it. My first guest on this roundup episode is from episode 15, Nicole Worth, and she is talking about working in cycles and the importance of rest. And oh my God, did she not drop some amazing nuggets in this. So take it away, Nicole. Something else that I think you would love is, so going back to like the plant analogy, like, Mm -hmm. so plants work, they're cyclical, right? They're cyclical and they work in seasons. And, you know, like us women, you know, we are, we are cyclical when we are cyclical humans and our hormones work on a 28 day cycle. And so what's about the hustle energy is if you think about our four phases of our body, if you are bleeding or not, you still have four phases, four hormonal cycles. There's four cycles with the moon, right? And our hormonal cycles also mirror the moon, which also mirror the four seasons of the planet. So this is really cool. So the moon is on a 28 day cycle. Our body is on a 28 day cycle. Now the earth obviously is on a 365 day cycle, but all of the four cycles are similar. There is a a spring phase, a summer phase, a fall phase and a winter phase. So when you think about the great mother earth herself, and this has been a huge shift for me is when I want to get into overdoing, when I want to get into, and I want to push my body, when she's very clearly saying it's time to rest, when I am in a fall or a winter phase of my cycle, or the moon is in the fall or winter phase of its cycle, because if you're not bleeding, you can always sync up to the energy of the moon. Um, And I want to push, I remind myself that the great mother earth herself, the great mother earth herself cannot be in spring and summer all the time. So you are not designed to be in spring and summer all the time, but we live in a society that is obsessed with productivity. And so it's, it's a constant reframing. And that's one of, I mean, I can always translate things back to mother nature. And if I can witness mother nature, it helps me ground into the fact that I am cyclical and you are cyclical. Males are cyclical as well. They work on a 24 hour cycle, but still they are cyclical. They are designed to rest throughout the day. And so if, That has been a huge shift for me is like, if I just remember that, like there is winter phases with mother earth and there are fall phases for a reason. And if they decided to power through and just do spring and summer, spring and summer, spring and summer, mother earth would burn out. She'd burn up. It's and so, and so would my body. And so would I, you know, like your personal experience with that. And so that has been a really great, um, it's like I look at a tree sometimes when I feel like I'm pushing and I just breathe and I remind myself, okay, the great mother earth can't do it all the time, 24, seven, three, six, five, like neither can I rest is a part of it. And when you rest, you spring, right? You allow the spring to happen when you rest. My next episode is episode 16 with Lisa McGregor. And we're talking about how she came up with her new alphabet for humanity and trusting her journey, which was such a next level quote. I hope that you enjoy this little snippet. 
one thing I'll share with our, our community of listeners is that trust intention and trust desire and manifestation and trust your journal entries, trust what you're writing down in your journal. Uh, so it's, it's really such a beautiful story what's unfolded the last few years. Uh, so when my son came along, uh, you know, I, I, he's five now. And when my son came along, I remember that my, you know, I, I got this idea. I wanted to be a good ancestor. I wanted to make a difference in, in his generation. And I started to write that in my journal. How can I positively impact my son's generation? How can I make a difference in education? Because I'd always thought about systems change. I thought about how I could see that these systems that we've built in the world, arguably we can all say are not working now, right? Like the political, the healthcare, the education, like it's everything needs to be changed. System. I mean, yes. it's not changed in 120 years. I mean, it needs exactly. radical reform. Exactly. You know, it's, it was built on industrial age values and we're moving out of that era. Of and so I, I started writing that in my journal. I was like, how can I make a difference? How can I make a difference in education? And the funny part about it is I don't have a degree in education. I did know that at some level, I was a spiritual teacher. I knew I was meant to teach. I'd, I'd run workshops and I've done different things where I've taught over the years. And so I wrote this in my journal. And uh, one day I had the most incredible eureka moment of my life. I was, I was at the beach with my son and he was three and uh, we were playing and, you know, and I, I just love, you know, you go to the beach, you're in nature, you're connecting. And I feel like that's where my, my intuition is strongest, where my divine downloads come from. Right. Absolutely. And of course being a creative person, I'm, you're always craving it. Like what's next. And uh, my son looked at me and it was like his soul was speaking to me. And he said, mom, what else have you got for me? And I realized in that moment that as a mom, as an ambitious mom, I had taught him everything I thought I was supposed to teach him letters, <laughs> numbers, colors. And I thought to myself, why is it that I haven't taught my son about compassion? Why haven't I taught him about empathy? What about diversity? What about gratitude? And in that moment, I got this list. I, I got this idea to write a list of alphabet words that I could teach my son that would really allow him to connect to his heart. Because I started even thinking, gosh, as a woman in my 40s, how is it that it took me this long to figure out how to have a heart connection and live a mindful life? And, you know, why, why is it that we're not teaching our kids from the very beginning? And imagine how different the world would be if our children learned from the very beginning what compassion meant, what empathy meant, what diversity really meant, what, what it means. And so I got this idea to write this list of alphabet words. And I shared it with Max, my son, and he got all excited. He started reciting the words and he was all, you know, it was instead of A is for apple, B is for ball, C is for cat, it's A is for abundance, B is for bravery, C is for compassion, oh, D is for diversity, oh, E is oh, for God. empathy. And uh, so I came home and I shared the list with my husband and he literally fell off his chair. He goes, Lisa, you've just rewritten the alphabet. He goes, this is, this is unbelievable. And so then I shared it with a few mom friends and they were like, Lisa, this is genius. You need to, you need to do something with this. This is a new alphabet. And so I had written a previous children's book before this, when I was, I traveled around the world with my son when he was a baby. And I wrote a book about that. And I was so inspired by, by writing children's books. It was, it was kind of like this newfound passion. And so my husband said, you need to write a book about this alphabet. And so we launched a Kickstarter campaign and it was incredible. On my 42nd birthday, the campaign was funded. Like literally in 48 hours, the campaign was done. And my husband calls me up and he goes, Lisa, he goes, did you see that your campaign's been funded? And I said, what do you mean? Like, it was a big stretch, you know? I can't remember what we were asking for. It was like $5,000 or something. And uh, he goes, it's, it's, it's funded. And it turned out that there was someone in the community that even put $3,000 as a pledge towards the project. And I just started crying. I thought, wow, like the world wants this. And as an entrepreneur, I thought I need to do this because I want to test the idea. So long story short, it was such a profound experience of my life. I got into the incubator of building this book and, and then I had to find, you know, the most sustainable book printer that I could find that used recycled paper and not toxic inks and all that. And so I went down this journey of publishing this book and, uh, and it was amazing. And we sent it out to our, our initial funders and they were so excited and they were saying, my kid loves this book. This is their favorite book. And so at uh, the start of 2020, we started stocking it in retailers uh, around Australia and Canada. 
And I was getting, it was, it was bizarre because they were calling me back every week saying, Lisa, we're out of books again. We're out of books. We're out of books. We need more books. And I was like, this is like, this is bizarre. And they're even saying to me, I don't understand. This book doesn't sit on the shelf. It just keeps leaving. People come in, they see the book, they buy it. And uh, then they come back and someone else says, oh, I got to buy this book. And then I started getting family and friends. Like I'd get grandma showing up at the back door and they're like, I heard about your book. Can I have 10 more? <laughs> and, and I'm, I just can't even tell you, like, it just like, it's like such a dream come true for me because I knew it was striking a chord. It was a heart connection. It was, there was something about this book that was, that was speaking to the heart and, and it was bringing us back to our humanity. And I realized the profoundness of the fact that I was just simply a messenger for this book. I was a messenger for, a, for the message of our times, which is that we, we're, we need to get back to the heart of what it means to be human. My next guest is episode 17, and it's the awesome Mike Michalowicz, who is one of my personal business heroes. He's written books like Profit First, and we talked all about the queen bee role. And this was game changing for me, the queen bee role. So I hope that you enjoy this clip from Mike. So the, the queen bee role was derived from what's called biomimicry. So what I believe to be true is, is something that nature figures out. I mean, she's spent you know, billions of years figuring yeah. stuff out. Why don't we just borrow those ideas? And uh, the queen bee role was the realization in beehives specifically that at any time, there can only be one most critical function for the survivability of the entire hive. And what it is, is the production of eggs. That's how the bees continue to survive. They got need to produce eggs. The queen bee happens to be one serving that function. My point is the queen bee serves an important function, but the queen bee isn't the most important bee. They all must serve that role of making sure eggs are produced. They all serve a different job doing that. So the question is in your business, What's that one thing that's the egg production? What's the one thing that keeps it going? That's the most important thing. And a, a shortcut to get there is basically you look at what, what do you stake your reputation on? Well, this baseball team, they're called the Savannah Bananas. Awesome name. <laughs> awesome name. Awesome name. <laughs> the Savannah Bananas realized that they're not out to win games. They're out to win fans. And that entertainment was the key factor. They, they're a small community team. They're not a major league professional team. So they want to engage families. So the entertainment is key. They want to be known for extremely fun family entertainment. Therefore, the role or the function that makes that, the most critical function that makes that a reality is the creation of new ideas. If families are going to come back day in, day out, they don't want to see the same five or six events. They want to see constant change. So the creation of these engaging ideas is their number one function. So this baseball team, dedicates one day a week to simply creating new ideas. And uh, then they come out with all these new ideas and they're rolling it out at the following game. I've now had the privilege to go to two of these games in person. It is the most engaging, thrilling, fun, laugh out loud experience I've ever had. And uh, the, the numbers speak for it. They are generating millions and millions in revenues where their contemporaries are lucky to scratch together a few hundred thousand dollars. They are on... ESPN, which is the biggest network here for sports in the US, they are on more than any other team in the, what's called the minor leagues or the all-star leagues. They are as popular almost as some of the major teams, professional teams, because they focus on the QBR. Episode 18 was Echo Summer Hill. Oh my goodness. We had so much fun on this call. We're talking about going inwards and putting yourself first. And as the queen of Get Selfish, the woman that wrote the book on it, I do love talking about putting yourself first and honoring yourself. So here is Echo's beautiful clip. I think what's beautiful and to preface this, I think it, you know, not, I think because I did have that addictive personality, that hustle personality, and I know you can probably relate to this, I'm really stubborn and I'm, I'm strong in my word and I'm strong in, if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And it, you know, this, that, and the other, well, I think that definitely helped when it was time to flip the script because I decided no more. And when I said no more, I was going to do all I could to heal from that, to shift things. And that's what I did. So I started 
my path really truly started with energetic healing and the spiritual community that I found. And, and then of course, like I went on this journey to tap into my own personal power that then I could be an alchemist and healer for others. And that's what, you know, I love doing, incorporating that into my days now and my mentorship now, but I dove deep into the spiritual world and it, it was obviously all encompassing because I'd been a life coach for 12. I today, today I've been a life coach for 12 years. Right. Mm -hmm. So I had known, you know, I knew better, but we, it's always easier to teach others than to take our own advice. We have to learn to be our best client. Right. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to turn into my best client. I'm going to turn into the best version of me so that I can be that shining light for other women to come out of whatever they're working through. And again, I'd been coaching women through life and business and transformations for a long time at that point, but it was time for me to do the work myself. And so I dove deep into my spiritual journey. I started getting healing. I started slowing down. I cut my hours in half. I cut how I showed up for people. I set healthy boundaries and standards for my life, my businesses. And I just went inside more. I needed to discover who I was, like you said, what made me happy, what I wanted. And at the end of it, I still want all the freedom and the abundance and and all of the things, but not rooted in hustle, not rooted in fear. That was another thing I had to clear a ton of fear out around. If I stop working so hard, if I stop the hustle, where's all my money going to go? Is my business going to fall apart? Am I going to do any, you know, what is going to happen? And I realized, oh my gosh, like it's going to be okay. And it was, and it's been okay. And it's been more than okay. And, and because I've been able to deconstruct that hustle in me through energetic work, emotional intelligence, you know, all of that beautiful inner work, which I always say, you know, it's the, as above, so below, you know, as within, so without it starts here. And I think so many times, especially high achievers like us, we seek that external validation, the answers, the knowledge, all of that outside of us. But when in reality, it's all within here. And so if we can keep tapping into that, that's where I have found my answers. I rarely go to, you know, I have, you know, Melanie and Lair is, is my mentor and, and coach. And then I have a business partner. That's my business coach for strategy and stuff, but it's very rare that, that I'm just out there asking for people's advice. You know, I turn inward more now than ever. I don't seek outside validation. I don't seek, you know, this and that every day I sit with myself first. I come first, which was a huge shifting point for me. I come before my husband I come before my son, I come before my leaders, I come before my businesses, I come before the dishes, I come before it all, because if I'm not taking care of me, if I'm not in alignment, mind, body, and soul, if I'm not happy, if I'm not feeling energized, I'm literally that cliche of pouring from the empty cup. And then I am giving half-assed versions of myself to everyone and everything around me. But if I fill myself up first, if I make sure that I wake up every morning and I go, okay, my intention is to feel this way. How am I going to make sure that I stay that way? And almost 90% of that answer is always being intentional, slowing down and breathing. Episode 19 was with Rune Sondervall. And it was talking about the fear of failure. We talked about so many things. I really, really, really enjoyed the conversation I had with Rune. And it was really hard to actually pick one um, little clip. But here we're talking about the fear of failure. So this is my clip with Rune. Being in that, like the Joseph Campbell of, 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 of the hero's journey, right? Being in that is like, well whatever's going to come is going to come, right? We don't really have that control, but when the dragon comes, we'll, we'll either slay it or, you know, you're not the same that goes in as that comes out of that journey. You're not the mm. same, you know, that, that ego is dead. You've got to come through that. And that, that, that 
differences is what you're, you're, you're slaying. The dragon is actually yourself, right? That's your ego that, that limits that belief of this stuff. Well, hold on. I'm so afraid of failing, you know, like, look, it stopped me many times from starting up. It started to stop me many times from actually going into a new thing or adding this and this. And I mean, the fear of failure is constantly there. And I mean, you know, like Elon has it as well. If you listen to his podcast and listen to some of the things he said, he has the fear as well. The thing is, is, is the fear is not the problem is, is, is if you let the fear control you because you yes. have no control anyway you have no control anyway the next episode i have is episode 20 with jacqueline ruiz and we're talking about survival stability success and the significance in this world and this was really really incredible episode and i can't wait for you to dig into this little clip with jacqueline but i think when a mission finds you you surrender and you follow that and follow those divine downloads and, you know, focus on creating those micro moments of acceleration and expansion and exponential growth. I think that's when, you know, you begin creating unimaginable, you know, opportunities, you open doors to create wealth. But um, a mentor once told me that most people live in four levels. Uh, one is the basic one is survival. And those people strive for the next level, which is stability have enough money to pay their bills. And those people then say, I want to have success, which is basically what I have for stability, but nicer, <laughs> mm -hmm. bigger, you know, nicer brands. And then the people that a lot of times reach success, they say, you know what, I've had it all. I can access anything I want. I make impact. Now I want to create significance. So it's all starts with an S, survival, stability, success, and significance. But right. he also told me that you don't have to have that. You don't have to follow that pathway. You can actually focus whatever you are in your financial world. Like you can focus on significance with a heart of gold, like with a heart of service. And you will achieve the success. You will achieve anything you want by helping enough people get what they want, which is what Zig Ziglar said. My next episode is episode 21 with Christy Whitman. And um, we talked about how she got her idea for her most recent book, the desire factor and Christy Whitman is a best-selling author so I hope that you enjoy this little snippet on how inspiration can flow in from literally anywhere. This one was interesting because I was literally at a um, Abraham Hicks seminar mm -hmm. and I was with my husband and all of a sudden I just got this the desire factor. And Esther hadn't said it, Abraham hadn't said it, but it was like this, the desire factor. And I went, oh, and I turned to my husband and I go, it's the desire factor. And he goes, ooh, what's that? And I go, I don't know, but I have a feeling it's, we're going to find out. And I go, it's a great title for a book. And he goes, yeah. So, and of course I sat with it because I didn't get any inspired action to do anything with it, but I wrote it down, right? So about a year later, I am on a cruise ship in the middle of the Mediterranean, I had gifted my mom and my dad, my sons who are at this point, I don't even remember how old they were, maybe five and six, um, who are now 10 and almost 12, and my husband. So the, the six of us, we go on this Mediterranean cruise and we just spent the day in Venice, Italy, and um, had a really wonderful morning having croissants and cappuccino. And there we were in San Marco Square and there was a band singing happy birthday to my dad. And the boys were, you know, having all the pigeons around them and they were feeding. So we had this oh, beautiful fabulous. morning. Yeah. And then, so my parents and my kids went back on the ship and my husband and I had our time because what you have to know is many years prior to that, when I first started dating my husband, I went on a two week trip to Italy with my parents and one of the places that we went was Venice. Now I'm a fashion girl. I've always been that way since I was a little girl. I just found a picture of myself. I think I was maybe three and I had a little Easter hat with the matching dress and the masking purse and the gloves and the shoes. I've just always loved to dress up like that. And so when we went into Venice many, many years ago, gosh, going on 15 years ago, um, I walked in and I saw for the first time all these different brands in all in one place. It was like Versace and Valentino and Dolce and Gabbana and Gucci and Chanel. I mean, it went on and on. And I was like a hummingbird going into each one of them. Right. And my husband had said to me, I, I, he was boyfriend at the time. I don't think I can afford you. And I said, <laughs> you don't have to afford me. I'm going to afford myself. You know, oh, I just, wow. 
I just left corporate America, just started my coaching business full time. And so it didn't make sense, you know, to, for me to go buy anything right at that point. But I said, mm -hmm. I'm going to come back here with you someday. And I'm going to go into any store and get whatever I want, not because I want to get stuff, but because I want the freedom of choice, knowing that I've created the success, created the money so that as you say, you can't afford me, I get to afford myself, right? I'm going to afford myself whatever it is that I want. I'm going to treat myself to whatever it is I want. So here we are back. On Full the circle moment. I yes. love this. I yes. Love so, so here we are, my husband and I do this, the shopping spree, right? And he's such a good sport because like a hummingbird, I'm going into or Dior and I'm going into Chanel and I'm going into all these different stores. And finally, I go into Dolce & Gabbana and I find this cute little bag. It was actually less expensive than anything else I saw, but it was this beautiful purse. And I thought that's the one. And so we had this beautiful rest of the day, had lunch, you know, got back on the ship. And so I'm unpacking this purse and I'm looking at it as this amazing symbol of my success. And I hear a voice say, that's so materialistic. And I was like, Hey, where'd that come from? You know, that, what, what? And that's where I was like, wait, how could this be material? Yes, it's material, but how can the journey I've just been on be wrong? How can that experience mm -hmm. of going in and feeling that freedom of choice and then being able to select what I want, how can that be wrong? And then the book started <sighs> downloading. And what it was, it was really an a understanding that everything here on earth is material, but it's also energy. That purse is energy. That experience mm. and that journey I've been on was full of energy. That mm -hmm. got me to the place of having a manifestation. That's not wrong, but we've been programmed to think it's wrong. The next episode is episode 22 with Ray Blakeney. And in this episode, in this little clip that we have for you, we're talking about intentionally focusing on the now, both in martial arts and how that translates into work. So I really enjoyed my interview with Ray and I love what he brought to the table here. So there's two aspects of meditation in kendo specifically, and these follow across to almost every martial artist. You mentioned Japanese. I did Kung Fu for a while as well. So I have a little experience in the Chinese martial arts. And the way kendo practice starts is you start and end every practice with meditation. Mm -hmm. So something they call mokso. So you sit down in a position, you get in a meditation position, and it's only for two or three minutes. But the idea there is when you get there, the, the point of the meditation when you start is to leave the outside world behind and focus on what you're going to do in the next hour, hour and a half, two hours, depending on how long your practice is. So it's kind of this clear separation of what's outside and what's inside. The meditation at the end is exactly the opposite, right? It's not necessarily to clear your mind. It's to, you know, shift out of what you were doing for the last two hours and shift back into your regular life. Mm -hmm. So that's one ask, one meditative state uh, in martial arts. The second one is actually while you're sparring. Um, because in Kendo, there's a, a saying called Kiken Taiichi, which means mind, body, and spirit is one. And you, to score, you need to have all of those things aligned. Otherwise, just hitting somebody is not good enough, right? You have to yell. You have to kind of have the right position to do it. And I find, especially when I'm really stressed out in my businesses, this is amazing. Because when you're sparring with somebody, when you're facing off with an opponent, and keep in mind, Kendo's an art where men and women face off with each other, because since you're using a weapon, the whole strength thing essentially gets eliminated, right? So men and women compete against each other, taller, older, everything kind of gets balanced out. But you can't think about anything else at that point, right? You can't be thinking about, did I check my email at work this afternoon? As soon as you do that, you get hit, right? So you need to be in the moment when you're practicing and sparring in martial arts. I find that very meditative as well. I mean, I cannot think about anything else for those two hours. And that is incredibly releasing. I mean, it sounds restrictive, but it actually is really freeing when I don't have to worry about anything else in my life. Just that moment where I am right now in what I need to do in this moment. And then that translates over to work. I do the same thing for work where you kind of, I start, I meditate at the beginning and end of each day, kind of to put myself in that mode. And I try to get into that mindset where I'm focusing on doing what I need to get done now, not worrying about things in the past or worrying about problems in the future. It makes me a lot more productive. My next episode that I have is episode 23 and it was with Alex Hargreave. 
And we're talking about methods he uses to keep maintaining a strong mindset. And what I love as well about this clip is that sometimes we're working on things that no one else can see. And that cannot always be great for morale. And what Alex talks about here is really, really allowing that to be higher, you know, how to keep your vibe high, even when you're working on something that is a long term project. I, I, I have listened to more motivational YouTube videos on <laughs> a regular basis. And it's not like any one video you go, oh, I realized something I didn't realize I uh, uh, or I'm suddenly you're going to magically be rich because you listen to, uh, uh, you know, motivational tapes on YouTube. But um, just hearing Every day, I mean, when, when I was at a point where very few, I think, believed in me uh, at various points throughout this company, people have had their doubts, particularly when it's been like two and a half years and our development team's working on something nobody's seen yet. Uh, and, and it's like, guys, I know when this gets out, it's gonna be great. And when it got out, the first partner we launched it with was SoFi and that was huge for us. Uh, uh, but that was three years of having to believe in, in my team and in something that people couldn't see. So I got to where listening to uh, Impact Theory, there's a whole, I, I forgot his name, I'd uh, say his name, but uh, lots of different, just motivational entrepreneur and getting that message in my head and hearing the grind other people have been through, hearing where they've hit their, uh, uh, you know, nervous breakdown, their major, it, there's, you'll find lots of people have that, uh, that are up at the high levels have had that point and just hearing how they dealt with it and the determination uh, and the drive and, and then Wim Hof was big for me in, in that uh, doing the breathing exercises in the morning, just 30 minutes. Um, it, it changed everything for me. I got just sudden control over my nervous system. I, I uh, uh, feel like I had lost or in the frenetic pace and just being stressed out all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, doing this every morning, I don't, I don't miss it religiously. And doing cold uh, immersion, getting in. Um, mm -hmm. I was living in Las Vegas at the time and had a pool. And in the winter, it was very cold. It was like 45 degree uh, temperature in the pool. And I would, to get control over my anxiety, I would get in that pool for uh, about five to 10 minutes. I built up to that. Um, and, and you breathe. I mean, your body, your, your initial reaction is, get me out of here, this is danger. But you, you learn to overcome that initial fear. You know, same initial fear, you get on a, coming on a podcast um, uh, right at the beginning. It's just like uh, when I get in the cold water, that, that first sense of <gasps> you breathe deep <sighs> and then, and, and your body will naturally uh, get better at, at um, putting you in a more calm state, uh, even when you're in the middle of chaos. My next episode guest is from episode 24 and it was Tony Patello. And oh my goodness, this woman was fascinating. I enjoyed interviewing her so much. Um, it was one of these people that you could just talk to forever and a day. And she talks in this clip about the importance of being in service. This is something that is so, so close to my heart. I really, really, truly believe that if every human being took being in service and not service, not servitude, but service, that we would transform this world in one generation. And here is Tony Patello's take on being of service and the importance of it. It's so beautiful. It's all about service for me. It's all about being of service. Um, and I know this might sound a little crazy, but I will say it's, it's really not about the money. The money is, is energy. It's yes. energy that flows. And it's a means of being able to uh, money is, is, is very important, don't get me wrong, because we can't have an impact on people without it. We can't be of service without it. We've got it, you know, it's got to flow. It's part of the energy flow. And, uh, you know, the more you can be of service, the more that you can stay close to your passion, stay close to source, you will be provided for you will always be provided for. Um, this that. is something that I have learned over the years is that you don't have to chase it. You don't have to worry about it. Mm. Worry is going to block it, you know. Yeah. Worry will block it. Greed will block it. Um, it's all karmic, you know. So 
we just have to know that and, and listen yes building building a six seven figure uh income is a powerful thing you can and you can have an impact on the world with the more money that you're Absolutely. making the more changes you can make the more you can help somebody and in big ways right so uh that's a very powerful vision and dream and desire as long as you keep things in perspective and understand that at the end of the day it's about being of service my next episode is from kim woods and it's episode number 25 and how she in sort of inverted the no like and trust method and how she brought that in-house to herself so we talk a lot about in entrepreneurial circles you got to have no like and trust and kim has a really cool take on no like and trust so here it is in this clip i'm so glad you brought up trust because and i just want you to feel in your body right now because because you know the no like trust customers need to know like and trust you right so i've i've inverted that and i've turned it inward and I say, you know, you open up your awareness and, I'm, and for those of you who are listening and can't see me, my hands are moving right now. And what I'm doing is I'm going, no, it's, it's obviously in those upper chakras and you're, and you're opening up to that awareness and you're allowing more information and understanding in. But then the like, if when you turn it inward, it's in that heart space and it's that dance with power and fluidity and collaboration and not competition. And you open up to support and opportunity and then you get into the trust and my hands are by my belly. And it's that's where creation resides. That's where prosperity resides. That's where money resides. And so I take my people through that no like trust because I found that that's a perfect weaving of the business and the intuition. And so people coming from the I business, love this. Yes. Right? People coming from the business world can come into that. People come from the intuitive world. It helps ground them, honestly. It helps ground them in, in the, oh, okay, I can lean in and I can understand. I can open up my heart more and I can stand in my power. And then and then going down to that trust element is that's 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 all the money. That's all the money, the gold, the creation, the prosperity, the abundance, the security, the safety. It's all the things. Episode 26 was with Jess O'Connell and she's talking about how source is the source of your money and I love this because this is something that I wholeheartedly agree with that there is no source outside source. Source is the source. So here is Jess with this powerful message. I think that we do have this really we're indoctrinated to believe that like service is transactional like it is it is like exchanging a product. Like I am giving you this product, you are giving me the money. And that isn't what we're created to do. And I think that especially if we're living in our purpose and really connected to that source channel, like you are cutting off your opportunities to serve by thinking that it only has to look a certain way or you can only serve if they've paid you or whatever. And I think that we have this really micro idea of what money is and looks like. And I think that we think that it has to be A for B equals money, you know, but really at the end of the day, being in greater service of the greater good, like spreading your message and being like that energetic in that energetic service place, that's what attracts the opportunities to you. And that like, and truly trusting that your clients are not the source of your money. Your products are not the source of your money. Your launches are not the source of your money. Like source is the source of your money. And by being, being open to that and being open to receiving that and it not having to look a certain way is the key to tapping into that like universal support and energy system episode 27 was brought to us with Meryl Krigsman and oh my goodness Meryl shared with us this incredible prayer that I absolutely adore and um, I've actually had my team write this prayer out for me and put it in um and have it I have it on my desk I love it so here is Meryl with that prayer I I often say this prayer to myself you know where where it's like dear god or goddess please crush crumble and dissolve anything that is no longer aligned with who you want me to be in this world and replace it with the people and opportunities that are 
and then just stepping into that, that oh, I don't I love control that. it. I don't need to try and make things happen that really want to crush, crumble and dissolve. Right. right yeah. So it's, 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 it's sometimes it's, it's about giving up what you think was the way to do it, to make place for the actual thing to be able to come through and to have the space, the, 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 the riverbank to, to flow, flow through. And that's all we got for you in this episode. I hope that you really, really enjoyed this gorgeous roundup on the Into the Light Web podcast on my Million Dollar Lab series. <laughs>